Okay, so thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Dan Timmons. You would be excused for thinking this is a wonderful day to go out for a walk today. I'm looking outside my apartment onto an NYU dormitory, and uh, but I do see sun coming down and I see no one in the dormitory still. So whoever thought I'd be so happy to live across the street from a dormitory. Uh, again, hi, it's Dan Timmons. Uh, welcome to our next webinar in what has become a current series with financial planners. Uh, the idea is that I'm hoping that we can uh, help my clients make good decisions during this time uh, of so much market uncertainty. Uh, just to say the least, to look at the stock market on any given day, it could go down 5%, it could go up 3%. Uh, it's caused a lot of people a good deal of anxiety. Uh, I know some people who have moved to cash. I've known people who have gone all in on stocks and I've known everything in between. It really depends on what your thoughts and feelings are. Uh, and my thought and feeling is that uh, I trust other professionals to make these decisions for me during these times. Today, we have Matthew Del Priori on. Matthew Del Priori is a certified financial planner. He works at Fortis Lux Financial, and uh, I've had the privilege of working with both him and his clients over the years. Uh, today, Matthew is going to be explaining to people in different age ranges, uh, some of the things that they can do to reshape their financial future during these turbulent times, and maybe even their present. You know, a lot of what people are doing is dependent upon what age they are, what risk tolerance they are. There is no cookie cutter method for anybody. Um, so I leave things like this up to people like Matthew to make sure that it's getting done correctly, uh, just because he's the expert in areas uh, such as this and not me. So I'm going to be making Matthew host, and I've done that at this point. Uh, and I am going to be asking everybody, if you do have questions or comments, I want you to go to the Q&A tab on your Zoom tab. So you will be doing that specifically uh, by going up to the Zoom tab and you will see a, uh, an option that says Q and A. So please do that. We'll answer questions at the end of this session. And I'm going to leave this to Matthew to uh, start driving. So Matthew Del Priori, please introduce Great. yourself and start driving. Thank you so much, Dan. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. You sound Very wonderful. Good. Very good. Great headphones. <laughs> well, thank you, Dan, for putting this together. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, to Dan's point, it is a beautiful day. So hopefully everyone does have the opportunity to get out and get some fresh air. Um, I first want to thank everyone uh, and, and hope that everyone is safe, healthy, uh, and everyone is uh, doing as best as they can during these trying times. Uh, and more importantly, for those of you who have friends, family members, and colleagues who are essential workers, we thank them uh, tremendously. Uh, my wife being a nurse, uh, have a uh, newfound respect uh, even more so uh, in today's environment. So Dan and I uh, put together this presentation, uh, titling it a top 10 guide to reshaping your finances during turbulent times. And the reality is, um, you know, this presentation can be used really during any time. Uh, and we hope that when you walk away from this presentation, you take one or two ideas that you can implement. Um, and to Dan's point, there are various backgrounds, ages, demographics on this call. So I will try to make it relatable. Uh, and even if you don't find yourself in that uh, age group, you might have a loved one, uh, parent, sibling, uh, child who falls in this sort of uh, area. Uh, so just a quick background about myself, uh, running my financial planning practice now for 16 years, uh, grew it from uh, nothing to where it is today. Uh, as Dan mentioned, I have a certified financial planning uh, designation. I have a master's in financial planning, but uh, always partner up with individuals who can really bring um, the best advice to our clients, hence why Dan and I work so well together. Um, I want to first start with uh, the importance of not panicking. It's, it's almost impossible to, you know, turn off the news and, and, and not hear what's going on. Uh, but it's really important uh, to, to realize that when we do panic, our rational decision making is lost. The neurotransmitters in our brain, and I, I am no uh, psychologist, but I do spend a lot of time covering behavioral finance, researching it, and that rational decision-making is lost. When, when we are in a state of fear, we stimulate the fight versus flight. 
in, in neurons in our, in our brain and causes us to make decisions that are not in our best interest. And I always like to use uh, the book that Dan Kahneman wrote, Thinking Fast and Slow. And in Dan's book, he mentions the two systems of thinking. System one thinking versus system two thinking. And system one thinking is, is instinctual, it's emotional. It's something we do without giving much thought to. We wake up in the morning and we brush our teeth or comb our hair. That's system one thinking. And I want you to try this on a loved one uh, or, or, or a friend later today. Nine out of 10 times this works. Ask someone to spell the word spot, S-P-O-T, and immediately ask them, what do you do at a green light? And almost everyone responds with the answer, stop. Again, that's system one thinking in action. We don't really give much thought to the question. This is how the media uh, portrays their information. This is how people market to us using system one thinking. Whereas system two thinking is more deliberate, requires more logic, requires us to take a step back, digest the information and understand what's really going on and how do you make effective decisions based on your situation. And that's what we as financial planners here try to do is really take a step back, take a breather, understand what's going on, and then help you make decisions based in that system two line of thinking. So the first thing we want to help our clients do is really take inventory. When you go on a trip, whether it be a short trip or a long trip, right, you, you make a list of the items you need. Well, the same holds true when it comes to your financial planning. Before we start to talk about insurance and investments and taxes, let's get our ducks in a row. Let's get organized. So the first thing I would ask people to really do is let's reassess our goals. And we have financial goals. We have personal goals, and a lot of these goals are intertwined. What we often ask clients to really think about is think in terms of SMART goals, the acronym S-M-A-R-T, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. And there's a big difference between, hey, I want to buy a house in five years versus I want to buy a $600,000 home in five years with a 20% down payment, right? It's specific, it's measurable, it's something that is time bound. So whether it be personal or financial, understand your goals because some of these goals are so way out into the future, we need to really chunk them down into smaller pieces. The next thing I want everyone to really understand is what are your cash reserves? In today's environment, cash is king, right? Understanding what you can put your hands on very quickly, so that if there are expenses that come up that were unknown or unforeseen, or you have other things that need to take um, a large chunk of your capital, let's understand your cash reserves. Let's understand the type of assets you have, right? And I try to break them down between non-retirement and retirement. I'm gonna talk more about that in another slide. And then understand your expenses, right? Understand the insurances you have in place. So, you know, put together a list of what you have in place so at least you have an understanding of where you're going. And let me uh, just interject with a few things on this slide, Matt. Uh, so if I am working with a client who may be in their mid thirties, maybe just had one or two children, uh, are their cash reserves going to be markedly different in the number of months or years they should have saved up as opposed to my client who's maybe 70 and get ready, getting ready to retire? What are some guidelines you would suggest that people strive for regarding cash reserves for starters? Sure. Great question, Dan. So I'll break this up into sort of two buckets. We have accumulators, those individuals who are saving money, still working in, in, in the marketplace, and individuals who are in the distribution phase or retirees who are using their assets to generate income. The accumulators, I typically will say anywhere from three to 12 months of cash on hand. And the reason why I give that vast range is if you have a working spouse and he or she is earning an income, I would argue that three to six months is sufficient, um, but maybe in this time, bring it out to closer to six. If you're a single worker, sing, single earner, there's no other earned income in your household, you probably want closer to from nine to 12 months. Because again, if let's say I'm out of work, but my wife is still earning an income, well, I have a little bit more cushion 
versus if my wife wasn't working and I was the sole breadwinner. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And especially if you're a business owner or an entrepreneur, I would go as far as saying, make sure that you have about 12 months expenses on hand because you're not only running your household, but you're running a business. Yeah. And, and I'll chime in. There was a big difference in my own life between 2008 and what's taking place now in, in 2020. Uh, it was frustrating being recently graduated from law school, having a negative net worth, and, uh, and then having cash reserves of month to month, basically having a few thousand dollars saved up and then not receiving any business. I think I, I came in contact with two clients in my first three months of business uh, after the, the Great Recession began. Compare that to now where you know I, I've had the opportunity to save some money. I can't tell you the difference it's made to me personally and to my clients. Some of my clients who had two years worth of cash reserves saved up, I used to think you're crazy. People with a few hundred thousand dollars even saved up in cash. And uh, some of the wise ones jumped into the market somewhere around the right time. If I say wise, maybe they were lucky. Uh, but cash reserves are, are key. I feel as though you can never have too much. I feel like many people don't have nearly enough. So I'll, I'll give it back to you, Matthew. But just a comment, don't, don't underestimate how much cash you need when you're younger, if you can save it. And then, of course, right as you enter retirement, have more than you think is reasonable. You, you won't regret it in a down market. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to piggyback on that comment, Dan, for those of us who are, might be in the distribution phase and no longer earning an income, I often, my standard is typically having one year's of cash on hand uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One, and I won't get into it in too much detail, but I like to have a buffer asset. Uh, and, and the distribution phase is much different from the accumulation phase. If I am in retirement and the market drops 20%, and I'm taking distributions from my market-based assets, I'm increasing the risk of run, running out of that resource. So I like to have a buffer asset so I can pause my withdrawals or income from market-based assets and move over to more of that um, buffer asset so that in time, that generally increases the longevity of your assets by about four to five years. And then secondly, for those of us who might just be retiring in this environment, you know, it's always good to have a good barometer. Hey, I started the year at 100K cash, and I'm getting distributions of X. Uh, at the end of the year, um, I have 110,000 in, in my cash. Well, that tells us that maybe uh, the income you're receiving is about 10 grand more than you need and allows us to adjust. And then last, and then I'll move on, is where can we park cash wisely? A lot of these online banks, whether it be Ally, uh, Marcus, uh, which is a Goldman Sachs bank, um, Capital One, have interest rates in, that are more competitive than our brick and mortar banks and are FDIC insured. So I would encourage folks to visit bankrate.com. Again, that's bankrate.com. And you can find the most competitive online money market accounts that are completely liquid and FDIC insured. So moving on, right, once we have enough cash, right, let's understand our expenses, right? I mean, it's, it's not a fun uh, exercise, but a very important exercise to understand what your needs are, no matter what phase of your life you're in. So we often ask our clients to understand what their expenses are by asking them to complete an expense worksheet. And I think in today's environment, it's more important to understand what are your needs versus your wants. Uh, and, and obviously, a lot of us aren't traveling anymore, doing things of leisure. So naturally, and maybe even transportation to it from, from work. Um, so naturally, our expenses might be decreasing. But maybe there are other things that we're overlooking. You know, in today's subscription economy, you know, I know I'm guilty of it, right? We have all these subscriptions that we sign up for, but are we using them, right? So identify where you can cut back especially if you are a little bit lower in cash reserves. And then understand potentially what major expenses are coming up that are, that are really not necessary. You know, is, it, is now the time to uh, start working on your kitchen or, or bathroom or whatever it may be, right? Perhaps these are items that are best served delaying until we know what the future may hold. 
And then the last thing I always say is where can we find money, right? Whether if we're a business owner and you're looking at the, you know, the PPP or the idle, uh, maybe the withholdings on our tax returns are too high or, or our paychecks are too high, right? So if we're withholding zero uh, on our W-4, perhaps we're giving more away to the government so that we can get a quote unquote bigger tax refund. Whereas, hey, I'd rather have that money now. Or perhaps our deductibles, maybe they should be a little bit higher, right? We have, if we do have a lot of cash reserves on hand, uh, maybe increasing deductibles on certain insurance will allow you to free up cash flow by reducing expenses. And there are other ways to try to find money. And I try to also, especially with my older clients who may be on the call, you know, really understand your health expenses. Uh, and, and hopefully everyone who's, by the time they reach 65 and a half, they understand how to, how to work with Medicare from front to back. It only takes a few months to realize there's more there than you may think. Um, you know, a lot of people who did not qualify for things like long-term care programs or just never got involved in them, really understand what your potential current and future expenses are going to be regarding those care needs. I can't tell you how much lack of planning there is surrounding healthcare. Absolutely. And, and just while we're on that topic, Dan, you know, the average 65 year old today will spend almost 245,000 on health related costs during their retirement year. So without a doubt, it's something that we need to be mindful of. Okay. This is something that is near and dear to me. Um, when you build a home, you start with a strong foundation. Well, the same holds true with your financial planning needs. And that's where insurance comes into play, right? If you don't have the right of insur insurance in place, everything else can potentially fall apart. So let's understand, you know, what you have at your employer. Let's understand what you have personally. Oftentimes what's given to you from your employer, or if you're a business owner, may be limited. So understand where the gaps are. And that's where professionals like ourselves and our team will help out. And then understand how you may be or should be uh, bridging that gap with personal coverage. To Dan's point, health insurance is a big area of question for a lot of clients, whether they're you know, working and they have employer sponsored plans. Maybe you're unfortunately out of work during this time. So you might have to go to Cobra or jump on the health exchange. Uh, if, you're for, if you're married or have a partner, perhaps he or she, you can jump on his or her plan, right? Uh, and some companies still to this day allow for domestic partners uh, to jump on one another's health insurance. And, you know, especially with Medicare, right? Typically speaking, if you're, you want to sign up for Medicare three months before your 65th birthday, and it's not just part A and B, but part D, prescription plans, what kind of supplemental plan should you have? Um, you know, and knowing what you're paying and what your options are is so critical. And so I personally have partnered with a lot of uh, folks in this area to make sure that you're getting the best advice as it relates to your health insurance needs. Um, second is your life insurance and disability. Your most important asset is not your home or your 401k. Your most important asset is your ability to wake up in the morning and earn an income. To provide an income for you and your family is so critical. So we protect our cars and our home, but why don't we protect our income? And that's where life insurance and disability insurance come into play. And it may not be just children who depend on your income. You might have an aging parent or a loved one with special needs. So again, make sure that your income is protected. Um, and there's so many different types of life insurance and disability out there. We're not going to get into it in today's presentation but ensure that your income is protected. And for those of us who are cl getting closer to retirement, I would say if you're in your 50s or later, this might be the time to explore long-term care, right? To Dan's point, uh, Medicare and other social programs don't cover long-term care needs. Well, Medicaid does, but you have to be impoverished. And for those of you who have done a good job saving, we can't rely on the government to care for us and those costs, especially in New York, are just astronomical. Now, I have a lady who's in Astoria, Queens, who pays about 160000 a year you know, for round-the-clock care at home. 
And then lastly, make sure that your property and casualty insurance is taking place. Homeowners, you know, this is a good time to just re double check everything. Your homeowners, do you have jewelry coverage? Do you have umbrella coverage? So again, we can spend a lot of time here, but I think it's important to make sure that at least you have the right amount of health insurance, explore your options, um, and really do your homework and work with a professional in this area. And let me chime in on the disability and long-term care insurance. I think everyone knows what life insurance is. It's, it seems to be the only insurance that pays and unfortunately you're dead. So isn't that how it works? But for disability insurance and long-term care, a lot of people think that there are government alternatives, which there are. You know, if you're disabled, eventually you can, without too much, too much trouble if you are actually disabled, collect from social security disability under the social security program if you've paid in for 40 quarters. Uh, I can tell you right now, if you're living in the greater metropolitan area of New York City, uh, you're, just, you're just not going to make enough money doing that. Uh, I know not everyone qualifies for disability. Myself, my disability premium is, is particularly high and uh, doesn't necessarily cover everything I would want it to. More importantly is the long-term care program. You know, just a reminder, starting October 1st, Home care Medicaid in New York is going to get much harder to qualify for. You're going to have to have transferred assets two and a half years ago in order for you to qualify for the program. What does that mean? Today, if I'm working with the client and I'm able to make them, quote unquote, impoverished in one month's time, I can then submit a Medicaid application. That one month is turning to 30 months. This is a major, major change for people. So people who have not gotten their long-term care insurance programs and figure, oh, I'm just going to wait for the government to be able to handle this. You're, you're going to be in for a surprise because most people who are on this call are not going to be doing Medicaid planning in the next four months. Great point. Thank you, Dan. So let's review other benefits, right? If we're fortunate to be at an employer who offers these benefits, let's try to take advantage of them. Uh, I always start with flexible spending accounts or health savings accounts. Uh, this is really one of the most unique tax advantages we have. Money goes in on a pre-tax basis. Money comes out tax-free for qualified expenses. The difference between FSA is you have to use it by March, 30, by March 15th of the following year, 2021 in today's instance, whereas HSA dollars you can take with you. Uh, and that goes with you through retirement. So I always encourage clients to maxim maximize your HSA dollars if possible. And just another added uh, benefit, there's a, a website, because I know last year I personally had extra dollars left over in my FSA account. There's a website called fsastore.com. That's fsastore.com. And essentially allows you to purchase certain items without you know prescriptions from that website and due to the cares act which was recently put into place after covid hit uh you now are able to purchase things like tylenol or other other over-counter medications which you weren't before uh without a prescription from this store perhaps your employer offers stock options or deferred comp plans let's look into those maybe this is the time to start cashing in those stock options, maybe not, right? Depends on, you know, a number of factors as it relates to your liquidity uh, or as it relates to the actual stock itself. You know, we typically will recommend not to have more than 10% of your liquid net worth in a single security. You know, this, the example I always give is back in 2008, Citigroup, major organization, went from $44 a share to $4 a share. So again, no matter how large the company, there's always these outlier events, one that we're living through now, that could happen. Maybe there are prepaid legal plans. Maybe there's an employee stock purchase plan, right? Allows you to purchase stock at a discount. I have a client who recently uh, joined Disney or another client who uh, is at uh, First Data. They can purchase shares at a 15% discount. And then other health and welfare benefits, right? Or discounts. Uh, my wife is a nurse is now receiving uh, discounts for major retailers that range from anywhere from 20 to 40% in, 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 in discounts. So, you know, it may take some time, but do your homework, right? These are retailers that we often use. Uh, take the time to understand what's out there and take advantage of these fringe benefits. And let me chime in because there's really no other 
great place in our presentation today for me to say that, to say this other than this. Uh, I am well aware that not everybody works for a large employer, and I'm also aware that several of my clients or else their children or, or one of their sons or daughters-in-laws may not be employed right now. They may be receiving uh, unemployment at this point. Uh, my, big, my big tip to these people is this. I know when income is, is low, you just figure I'll take everything I can get and you don't withhold taxes on that unemployment. Uh, it's just so important to, to suggest to your family member that they have the option where they are actually having income taxes withheld. And the other thing is this, like Matt says, you know, if someone just lost their job, you don't want them to forget about their FSA or their, their health savings account dollars. These, these are things that, that may still be there, even for executives who may have lost their job, they may have vested stock options that they're just not familiar with. So um, even for the unemployed, there are benefits that may be there. Uh, and plan accordingly for those benefits that you're receiving. Great point, Dan. And you also alluded to those who are, you know, more entrepreneurial. So, you know, you and I both belong to the Financial Planning Association. And so, you know, there are discounts through associations we can take advantage of. So, again, it may take some time to do your homework, but definitely worth it. So the age old, you know, investments, right? So what are we doing here? And this is going to, you know, really range depending on where you are. But I think the first thing is, again, back to my first slide, let's understand where we are and look at any allocation changes or rebalancing that one needs to do. So here's the example I give of rebalancing. And I think this is important going through because if you rebalance your portfolio on an annual basis, uh, you will effectively increase your return by almost 1% over the 10 year period. Rebalancing says this, I have a portfolio, it's 50% stocks, 50% bonds. Well, after March 15th or thereafter, it was no longer 50-50. I might now have 40% stocks because the markets hit some lows and 60% bonds. Rebalancing essentially brings your mix back to 50-50. It sells off that extra 10% in bonds, sells high, and buys back into stocks, buys low. Essentially what we want to do, sell high, buy low. And so this is something that we take for granted. And this might be the time to go back into your 401ks, go revisit your IRAs, and make sure you're rebalancing. I'm a big believer in goals-based approach to investing. So for those of us who are accumulating assets for retirement and we're 10, 15, 20 years away, continue to remain invested in the market. In fact, this is a good opportunity to continue to invest into the market. And we're gonna talk about a strategy we call dollar cost averaging, which is very well known and, and, very, and holds up in, in all markets. Uh, for those of us who are maybe in retirement, we really need to take a look at, well, what are we doing to continue to generate income? Are there ways to protect myself on the downside? We spoke earlier about the buffer asset, right? Pausing withdrawals from market-based assets and taking withdrawals from things that are more fixed, right? So I had a client who needed to pay a large life insurance premium. We specifically took it from the fixed income allocation in a portfolio as to not put more pressure on an asset that has declined by almost 10% in the equity markets. And that's a, that's a strategy that works over time and putting less pressure on those assets. So again, if you're buying a home, maybe in the next two to three years, one would argue that none of that money should be in the market. There's more to be lost than there is to be gained. So understand the time horizon you have uh, and as it relates to the goal and make sure that your investments are in line with those respective goals. Um, and one would argue that, oh, I'm in retirement, even if you just start a retirement, so I don't have a long time horizon, the average 65 year old couple, there's a 50% chance, five zero, that one person makes it to 92 and a 25% chance one person makes it to 96. So people are living a hell of a lot longer nowadays. And so you're gonna spend the next 25, 30 years in retirement without a paycheck. It is important to have some exposure to the market where we will be rewarded in the long term. And let me ask a quick question regarding that. You know, I, I try to tell, I joke around with clients when I meet them, I say, you know, you're not old until you're 90 and how, you know, if I meet a 75 year old, they're in my dating pool, whatever. Um, 
you, you're not, but it, it, but you were at one point in your life. But uh, I, I'm always trying to remind clients that I understand that you know you just want to have fixed investments. If you're looking at at a goals based retirement as opposed to just get me, you know, five thousand dollars of liquid income every month. Uh, I find that those people tend to end up having more money because they planned correctly. I can't tell people enough that this whole model of just work with a, a, a stock jockey and try to make the most money or be stuck in a 1% a fixed investment is, is not the best way to go about doing this. Um, if you've been taking income out the last five years, I'm, I'm impressed by your durability. Human durability is amazing. But you know, I haven't seen a good interest rate on too many things. And I don't know if you want to comment really quickly on any good interest rates that you're seeing, Matt, or where people should get fixed income. But but I can't see anybody wanting to be 100% in fixed income at this time at almost any age, unless you are 96. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very tough. So, so I'll take a step back and just say, you know, lost my train of thought. I but put yes. them on the spot. <laughs> yeah, fixed income is, you know, in today's environment, right, you know, and to generate yield, it's really tough to, to generate yield just on fixed income. And if you look at some of corporate rates today, you know, you might get three to 4% if you're lucky, but you have to go out really long in duration. So we try to ladder our fixed income securities by buying maturities of, you know, one to 10 years so that as interest rates creep up, you can naturally take advantage of that by buying new maturities of bonds. Um, you know, I, I think using annuities in, in the terms of risk pooling has a lot of merit, um, you know, and, and a lot of large insurance companies do this for themselves is, you know, you know, when you look at Harry Markowitz put together modern portfolio theory, the issue with modern portfolio theory is it, it goes to an endpoint right? It's really meant for institutions. Whereas planning for individuals, there's no end point. It's not just get to retirement, but we need to get through retirement. Um, so using vehicles that have risk pooling or higher interest rates uh, really enable us to get more income with certainty. You and know, I've poo-pooed annuities on occasion. For, for those of you who don't know, I was an annuities marketing specialist for several years. Uh, so when I poo poo something, people should maybe listen, you know, annuities in this environment, they don't look so bad. They have government protection. So if you have a few hundred thousand dollars in your annuity, you're not likely going to lose that money, even if the insurance company goes broke. Uh, and if you're in a variable annuity, I mean, it's not great for Medicaid planning, but you probably have some type of living benefit that will make sure that you will get fixed income into the future. And you'll be able to guesstimate what that's going to be with some accuracy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then just a, a moment on risk pooling, right? If we have, I believe there's about 40 of us in this, in this room, you know, or 30, right? So if there are 30 of us and we all pool money together, you know, five years later, there's only 25 of us left. Well, essentially 25 of us are sharing the same pool of money versus 30. Uh, that's the whole concept of mortality credits. And we don't get that with fixed income securities. We don't get that with equity securities. And that gives us an advantage of security. Um, the other thing I'll talk about is, you know, I talked about high concentration uh, stock options, you know, really you want to review those. Um, and then this is the time to start consolidating. We often find that clients uh, we work with are, you know, um, moving from one institution to another and they take their eye off the, off the ball, right? So if you have all of your 401ks, at least in one place, one purview, um, you can have a better chance of um, you know, managing that. And my other thought came back to me, Dan, uh, you mentioned having this sort of behavioral coach, right? So Vanguard did a study and they've attributed a, a, an, an additional 1.65% to your overall portfolio during the course of someone's lifetime when you're working with a coach, uh, whether it be a financial planner or someone else in that space. So definitely, you know, and then I can talk about Dalbar, right? Uh, an independent company that does research every year and says, look, the past 20 years, the market's averaged about eight and a half percent. Average investor, same market, same fund, same time period, averages three and a half percent. Why? Because we get in and we get out, right? When, when do we get back in when we feel that things are more appropriate? 
So again, remaining invested in the long term, right? Having that asset allocation, money in different asset classes is the key to portfolio longevity. Here's the question everyone's asking, is this the time to buy? And so when we started pre-COVID, the market was at an all-time high, just using the Dow Jones, was close to 29,000. And at the market low, uh, we were at about 18,200. We we're pretty much smack in the middle of that trading right now. And I don't know where we're going. If I had that crystal ball, I wouldn't be on this webinar today. However, I will say, with, you know, we're going to bounce around here a little bit. I don't think we're going to be testing those lows, but it's anyone's guess as to where we go from here. So is it the right time to buy in the long term? Absolutely, especially if you're a young investor. Um, but I would first assess your liquidity. Oh, I, <laughs> um, so the first thing is, you know, if you don't have an emergency reserve or you have very little in cash, well, this might be the time, you know, not to just put all your eggs in the one basket because if you put your money in the market, things can you know, quickly go in the other direction. And if you needed those funds for an emergency and that happens, you know, we could be stuck with a 10 to 12% loss. So address and the situation. It, it, I'll speak to liquidity really quickly, just I, I hate to cut off a, our presenter midstream. You know, in, for those of us who are, um, are having issues regarding whether or not we should be jumping into the market or not. We feel like it's perhaps way too high. The, the interesting thing to remember is this, you know, in, in 2003, when the, the tech bubble finally burst, or I should say it finally started getting better in 2003, but when the tech bubble burst in 2000, people got out and they got slaughtered when the market shot back up. And then when 2008 happened, people got out and they got slaughtered because then clearly the market almost quadrupled. Now I feel like those investors have gotten smart enough that they're really not pulling out of the market. And, and we can talk about, you know, market valuation and, and price to earnings ratios, all that we want. Most of us are probably not qualified to have that discussion. But I think some of this fear that people have is, you know, in 2008, there was a real question whether or not capitalism was, was going to make it. Was it something that, that made sense or was it going to go to the dustbin of history? Now I think most people feel pretty confident that, you know, uh, despite the fact that there's a group of people who may, who may be very heavily vested in, in a more socialized system, people more or less feel like the stock market's gonna, gonna stay and they believe in the United States. Um, so is there a chance that the market could dump again? Absolutely. Uh, but I'd like to think that there's at least some chance that the market will long-term recover. And uh, that's why I really wanted to have Matt, and I, I am glad he's speaking about dollar cost averaging at this point. Absolutely. And, you know, just to piggyback on that, you know, I am a big favor of, you know, domestic over international right now. Um, I'm a big believer in large cap over small and mid, right? So the companies that are around, you know, that have more, larger, you know, balance sheets are going to fare better in this environment than our small companies and our mid-sized companies. And if anything that was learned from the 2008 financial crisis is keep more cash on hand. Um, so you're going to see a lot of these larger companies weather the storm and, you know, above and beyond that, I think from a sector perspective, I think tech and healthcare really lead the way out of here. I mean, technology is in everything. So again, I'm not saying all your money goes in tech or, or healthcare, but it should be skewed more towards that direction in my humble opinion. As we go into the investing, so here's what I'm doing for clients today, right? Someone has a hundred thousand, someone has 500, whatever it is to invest. I'm suggesting that we dollar cost average. So what is dollar cost averaging? So you see here, this individual, he or she decides to put in $12,000 at the beginning of the year. And so at the end of the year, this person, he or she, has the same 480 shares that they purchased and their average cost was the same, $25. Whereas this individual here decided to take that $12,000 and divvy it up over the course of 12 months, $1,000 went in every month. And so as the market came down, what happened? More shares were acquired. And at the end result is this individual now has more shares. This individual has a lower cost per share. And so they're in a better position um, in the long term to take advantage of these declining markets. So again, just like when we take a shower, we don't just jump right in. We kind of stick our hand and we test the water a little bit. 
Same holds true with investing. Start to test into the market. Don't time the market. Get in, continue to pick a day, 15th of the month, and every and then and go at it diligently. And also to figure out how much you want to go into the market. That's where I'd say you need to work with your financial professional. I work with many financial planners. The concept of dollar cost averaging, you see, is, is not so difficult to grasp. The question is, how much money do you want to place into that bucket? Good point. Good point. So the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, being smart from a tax perspective. And I'm no accountant, but I do spend a lot of time uh, with professionals, making sure that people are taking advantage of what they can. I'm a big believer in controlling what we can. And so this could be the opportunity to do some tax loss harvesting. You know, are there losses in your portfolio uh, that can help offset gains from prior years or vice versa? Um, so this is a time to really understand your after-tax holdings and see if there are ways to um, match gains and losses. And we can typically do that with individual securities. I also love going back, and I've done this a couple of times this year, especially when the market was low, is looking at Roth conversions. Here's the simple concept. I have $100,000 in my traditional IRA, which I know I'm gonna pay taxes on in the future. It's now worth 70,000. Well, instead of converting before, I'm gonna convert now. Convert at a lower balance, 70,000, pay taxes on 70,000. And eventually when the market recovers, now I have a tax-free bucket of money versus taxable. Maybe I should start looking at bunching deductions. For those of us who may not itemize anymore, because of the 2017 Tax Cut and Job Act, a lot of us don't itemize. We take the standard deduction. Well, if we're philanthropically inclined or we're making uh, charitable contributions, perhaps, hey, maybe instead of doing 10,000 per year, I'm gonna bunch them and, and take 20,000 this year and not do anything the next. Well, for those of us who are over 72, taking RMDs, required minimum distributions, we can redirect those RMDs directly to charity so that we don't pay taxes on that distribution and has a much more impactful way than if you were to itemize your taxes. Oh, and by the way, because of the CARES Act, if you are over 72, and again, 72 because the SECURE Act of 28, 2019 has now postponed your RMDs from 70 and a half to 72, you no longer have to take RMDs this year. That allows us to, again, let the market continue to recover. So I'm throwing a lot of acts in there, Secure Act, CARES Act. We don't expect people to know this. This is why professionals like myself and Dan work with you. And why we get paid. <laughs> <laughs> Acronyms are good for us, but let's continue. <laughs> And then lastly, if you are in a crunch, I am certainly no advocate for taking distributions from your retirement plan for non-retirement expenses. But if you need to, before 59 and a half, we can now take income from our IRAs without that 10% penalty. Oh, and by the way, we now have three years to pay that back. So, uh, you know, that's a taxable distribution, but we're given now three years to pay that back. So again, just be mindful of what's out there. And if you're uncertain, reach out to your tax advisor or your financial planner you're working with. And if you don't have one, feel free to reach out to us. Last but not least, or uh, th third to last slide, let's restructure our debt where appropriate. You know, this could be the time to refinance your mortgage. Interest rates are at all time lows. Is this the time if you don't have enough emergency reserve to tap into your home equity line of credit. Hey, remember that cash value life insurance policy we created? Hey, maybe that's a good source of cash to tap into. We often forget we have that and it can be a very good time or good place to access cash. And then for those of us who might have student loans, federal loans are on deferment with 0% interest until September 30th. Again, understand what your options are. Um, there are a lot of players in the marketplace right now who are refinancing student loans, Common Bond, um, First Republic Bank, SoFi, to name a few, are getting more aggressive in taking care of your student loans or at least refinancing them. So let's understand what your options are. You know, don't take no for an answer, right? Every time, if you don't ask the question, the answer is always going to be no. So call your mortgage company, right? Call your auto provider. 
maybe they're offering better terms or at least allowing you to delay if you need that capital now. And I also like to tell people because some of my clients who are on this call have children who are adults, uh, they may have debts, they may have student loan debts, they may have mortgages, et cetera. And you kind of want to, you know, stay out of your kids' finances a little bit. Don't worry, they want your money for someday in the future, but they really don't want to hear your advice right now. Figure out a good way to discuss with them the fact that there are a lot of great refinancing opportunities. Some people get upset because they don't have great credit. Um, you know, you just never know what's available to you in this environment. Uh, a lot of these lenders haven't quite caught up to the new reality, and we don't even know the financial, the, the ultimate financial effect of all of this. So feel free to reach this topic or broach this topic with uh, family members that it may impact as well. Great. Thank, thank you, Dan. Good point. Good point. Second to last here, we have, you know, this is where Dan comes in, right? So we don't like to look at it, but it's important. So let's reassess our beneficiaries, right? Who, you know, when we start a job or leave a job, we don't, we're not required to name beneficiaries. It's something we have to go out and do on our own. It's not provided for you. So double check the beneficiaries on your retirement plans on the life insurance that you have in place, both at the employer. You know, um, maybe you had a, a life-changing event. Maybe you've gotten married. Maybe you've gotten divorced. Maybe there was a loved one who have passed, or maybe there's a new one, a new loved one in your family. So understand who your beneficiaries are. And make sure that's coordinated with the legal documents that you have in place. So this is a great time to meet with Dan and your legal professionals to make sure that your wills are updated. And the two things that come to mind for me are, number one, there's the new Secure Act, which places some more restrictions on retirement assets. And then there's something called REFUTA, another acronym, which talks about digital assets. And more and more do we have assets online, whether it be accounts at Facebook or, or uh, you know, usernames and passwords. So, so I actually want to kick it off to Dan and just kind of say, Dan, what are you doing here for your clients and how are they taking action in today's environment? It's, it's funny because the slide that I'm most qualified to answer on, you basically touch the things that I, I would want to review the most. Uh, number one, there are changes to retirement plan assets. And this was the case, and, and I, I sent out a, a quick little blurb about it in a postcard, and I've written on it, and my next newsletter will have a decently large article on it. Uh, but the SECURE Act changed how your non-spousal beneficiaries, basically any person other than your spouse, uh, is required to take your retirement plan distribution uh, within 10 years, with some exceptions, people who are 10 years younger than you or older, so like your, you know, your younger brother may still be able to stretch out that distribution for more than 10 years, disabled individuals and minor children, or minor children can't inherit assets anyway. Um, so it's, it's a good reason to get back in touch with me. But what Matt said that, that really stands out is what a great opportunity to, to check your beneficiary designations and make sure they're correct. I mean, many of us, that are, our biggest investment right now is the amount of time we put into walking to the refrigerator to get bonbons. Um, maybe spend a few moments just getting on your computer and checking your beneficiary designations. Or if you've created a trust within your will for the benefit of your children or some other individuals, maybe niece and nephews, maybe even charities, you know, check and make sure that that beneficiary designation is correct. If you have any questions, you know, obviously reach out to me. Uh, but, but this is the time because you're never going to have this much time available to yourself where you're stuck at home in front of your home computer. I know some people are working more, but you're working on that computer. So give yourself a, a five minute break and check it out. Um, otherwise, you know, this is, and, and I've been going over this the last several weeks. This is a time for people who are in need of an estate plan to rush and do it. But once this all passes, and who knows, I could be in another six months, I don't see clients getting very enthusiastic to meet me in my 10 by 15 square foot office to, to listen to me talk to them face to face for six hours. Um, you know, whenever this does change, any document that you have executed with an attorney, ask them whether or not you can execute it again face to face. Uh, virtual notarization is just a rife potential uh, world of litigation that's just waiting for us. So as some really jerky uh, opposing counsel once told me, just because it's a bad lawsuit doesn't mean it's not a lawsuit. So just keep that in mind for the future as well. Thank you, Dan. Um, 
All right, so I'm not gonna go through this in its entirety, but I'll leave this next to last slides. You know, this is what we cover here at Fortis Lux. And part of what I tell clients is, look, we don't look in a vacuum and make decisions based on, you know, one area. We take a 30,000 foot view approach to make sure that everything in your financial life is rowing in the same direction. And so the decisions you make with your investments impact your taxes and your estate planning and so on and so forth. So that's something to keep in mind. And, you know, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but again, the process really starts with learning about you. So if you don't have a financial planner, we would love to engage in a conversation. Um, you know, the first step is really understanding you, what's important to you, your goals and your values and objectives. We as human beings make decisions based on emotion. Let's understand what your values and goals are and the rest will go from there. So I wanna wrap it up with one slide and that's you know, the most important thing to me in this environment is there's no price on your human capital. You can't place a price on that. And this is the time that if you are you know, finding yourself with more time than usual, maybe it's now time to start to go back and reskill or retool or redefine yourself. You know, have you been putting off that extra class that you could have taken or extra designation or certification? Maybe you never started that business or got involved in something that you were truly passionate about. So I always encourage folks like you know, that are on this call to take the time to better themselves because there's no better you know, yielding rate of return than you as a human being. With that being said, my email address is here. Would love to hear from you. I think we're gonna open it up to some questions. Would love to keep it uh, an open dialogue and stay on as long as need be. Great. Uh, I did get a thank you from uh, Corinta D. Hey, love you, Corinta. It's great to see you. I hope you and your family are okay. Uh, a question from Philip K. Dan, I hear much about pay your debt and don't worry about a cash reserve. Is there an opinion on what to send you or where, excuse me, to send your excess funds, debt or savings? I'll kick that to Matt. Yeah. So it's kind of a, you know, a, a hard thing to look at, but I would say if you have high interest debt, you know, you want to start there first, um, potentially look for ways to consolidate that debt, whether it be, you know, moving it to a, a lower interest rate credit card. But, you know, what's going to happen is you may pay off that credit card debt with cash, find yourself in a position with no cash, and then only to put it back on the credit card. So you kind of have to play that balancing act between, you know, maybe paying off some of the higher interest cards first, keeping some level of cash on hand, and maybe there are expenses that we can continue to put on cards where others we can't, um, and then try to find areas where you can raise cash if need be. You know, if you're gonna take money from your retirement plan, take it as an, on an as needed basis versus hey, I need 50 grand today and then I'll just keep it in my cash account. No, take it as you need it so you, min you minimize the amount of um, tax uh, liabilities. Excellent, we have a, another thank you, lots to think about from Irene C. Uh, let me just chime in because sometimes you get more questions than others. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware that a lot of people who are on these webinars are clients of mine who may have financial planners. I'm not trying to tell you rip you away from your existing financial planner. What I am trying to do is help you get educated as to your finances, give you some ideas of what to go back to your planner on from these discussions. If you do not have a financial planner, you know, I've, I've had a, a Stephen Cohen last week and Matthew this week, they happen to know one another. You know, the whole idea here is that if you don't have a planner, I'm trying to give you the opportunity to find someone to work with. If when Matt says that you come out ahead with a planner, I don't think a financial planner has been able to quote unquote outperform the stock market for any of my clients. That's not what this is about. It's about trying to have a, a accountability and see opportunities. Uh, I, I can't tell you enough, I work with financial planners. And at one point, I remember when I was uh, just kind of coming out of my own personal funk after the 2008 crisis, which seemed to last way too long, uh, Matthew had given me a flow sheet and he said, figure out your expenses. And as simple as just knowing that I had to make X dollars a month to get by and then Y dollars to actually enjoy my life it made such a difference because I was able to focus on exactly how much I needed at any time. So I've never thanked Matt enough for that. So thank you, Matthew. It really made a huge difference in my life. And I'm a CFP. Uh, so sometimes it just helps to speak to a professional on these things. They just know this better than you and I do. Thank you. Uh, 
any parting words that you have for anybody, Matthew, regarding uh, anything, investments, um, something that resounds with people who are maybe 25 to 85? I think, you know, um, take one or two things from this presentation and take action. So, you know, uh, Helen Keller had a quote that I always use, you know, great ideas are worthless without action. So, you know, if, you know, you don't walk away from this and take action right away, the further we go away from, you know, taking action. So take one or two things and implement and, you know, reach out to your planner today if you have a question and, and you know, get it done. And I appreciate that, Matthew. So that being said, uh, this is the end of our webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, Matthew, or anyone else that you think is going to be able to assist you getting through these interesting financial times. Wish you all the best of health, wealth, make lots of money, stay happy, and stay in touch.